Today we have the Shoreline Storage Tunnel Project, which is a, a nearly three mile long um, diameter tunnel that will capture and store overflows so that it doesn't expel into the lake and into the rivers. And instead, it'll transport it to the Easterly Wastewater Treatment Plant for treatment. Um, so this storage tunnel crosses portions of land owned by the city of Cleveland, and that would be Forest Hills Park, Glenview Park, Sam Miller Park, Rockefeller Park, Gordon Park, and Gardena Park. And the sewer district is seeking 13 permanent easements and 10 temporary easements from the city. There will be above ground shaft sites, which is how you get into the tunnel, at Forest Hills Park and Gordon Park. There's gonna be a regulating structure at both Gordon Park and Gardena Park. All the other parks are subterranean impacts, meaning there's gonna be no surface impacts at all. So that's how the structure of, of, of the easements are broken down. You did get, um, you should have gotten a map um, to show you the park locations as well. Um, so about the compensation. So the easements are um, in total valued at um, uh, $557,400. But we have something structured here a little bit differently because of the, the long time that these parks are being impacted at the surface level, specifically Forest Hills Park and Gordon Park. So typically the sewer district gives $100,000 for an area that's been impacted for a period of time if someone else is gonna maintain the um, improvements up above. But at Forest Hills Park, what we're proposing is that They'll give us the 100,000, but the $400,000 that would be spent on easements, they're gonna give back to us for park improvements. And so those park improvements um, would be, have been worked out with the Department of Public Works, and they would include installation of basketball courts, a baseball facility, and a play field at this park. Those are the park improvements that are being impacted. And again, that $500,000 total, 400 was the value of the easements, 100,000 from the district would go into a special fund to solely um, fund the improvements at Forest Hills Park when they're done. Okay, and the, the value of the, of the easements was done by, um, by an outside appraiser, I'm assuming? Yes, yes, okay. uh, Mr. Chairman. So outside appraisal, um, fair market value for the easements. For the easements, and yep. the value of the improvements was, was uh, done by whom and how did we get to that number? So it was a good way to give the city a big chunk of money to make those improvements. Okay. So, you know, the, their project won't be finished for a couple years, so at that point, it would move into a, a regular capital project to assess, you know, the current construction costs of those improvements. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, ordinance number 659-2021 has been heard and recommended Four passes by Committee on Municipal Services and Properties. I would like to ask Chairman Kevin Bishop if, he's, if he has anything further on 659. Mr. Chairman, we, uh, we vetted 659 and we, uh, we approved it. Great, okay. thank you. And this was relieved by uh, Committee on Development, Planning, Sustainability. Uh, Chairman Bragatelli is not with us today. Are there any further questions, comments on ordinance number 659-2021? Councilman Brian Casey. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, to the Commissioner, um, when it says here the compensation for such easements and a gift of cash, is the gift of cash the 100000 that you're talking about or is it the 400000 Mr. President, to the commissioner? Yeah, so, so uh, through the chairman of the councilman, so essentially we're selling them the easements and they're gifting us the money back. Okay, so, so, yeah. so the total gift of cash is the 500000 So the, the 400. gift of cash would be... Um, yeah, five hundred forty-seven thousand four hundred. Okay, and then, but of that cash, four hundred thousand of it is going toward park improvements. So there, there's another piece of this. So there's, there's um, Forest Hills Park, which we talked about. There's also Gordon Park, and Gordon Park, they're gonna, there's gonna be, one hundred and forty-seven thousand four hundred dollars, which is the value of the easements. Those are gonna come back to us as a gift. No additional hundred thousand on top. But in total, that's how, how, how we come up with the gift amount. All right, Mr. President, to the commissioner, what's the total amount for this piece of legis legislation that's a gift of cash? It, so it'll be- five. In other words, how much will the, will the city be 
receiving in cash that's supposed to go toward park improvement then? Yep, it'll be $547,400. All right, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Anything further on ordinance number 659-2021? Hearing nothing, ordinance number 659-2021 stands approved. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Okay, moving now to capital projects. Anybody here for capital? Okay. So sewer projects, sometimes they do burn through. Drek, how are you? Good, and yourself? Good. Uh, we're here to hear ordinance number 690-2021 by Council Members Bashir Jones Bishop, Brank Italian Kelly by Departmental Request. An emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Capital Projects and or City Planning to enter into one or more contracts with defa default LLC for professional services necessary for the design, production, and installation of a yet-to-be-designed public artwork associated with and installed at the renovated Kabasik Recreation Center. Director. Yes, uh, Council President. Yeah, the artist was recommended by the Public Art Committee and approved by City Planning Commission based on qualifications and preliminary general conceptual idea was the understanding that he would further develop the concept for the Kabasik Rec Center. It is understood he is expected to create an artwork inspired by the interested parties, which, in, which include, but are not necessarily limited to the city staff, the neighborhood residents, Councilman Bashir Jones, and other uh, stakeholders. The ar artists are hired through the public art uh, program, are normally hired based on specific concepts that have been presented to and approved by the City Planning Commission. Uh, in, this, in this situation, however, the Public Art Committee uh, with the City Planning Commission uh, um, Consent determined that hiring default LLC before specific artwork was proposed would be the preferred approach. Um, this was a, an effort to accommodate input from the community to design an artwork that would be specific and appropriate for the rec center. Um, the cost of this uh, art um, contract would be $64,000. Again, it's at the classic rec center. Um, design a, it will take about four, month, four months in fabrication, about six months to install. Um, and this is in Bashir Jones's ward. Thank you. And have you spoke with the councilman about it? Yes. Okay. And he's supportive of it? Yes. Okay. And I believe I heard you say that Planning Commission has approved this? Yes. Okay. And our Public Art Committee has approved this and opined on this as well? Correct. Thank you. And this was also heard and recommended for passage by uh, Committee on Municipal Services and Properties. I would like to hear from the chairman of that committee, Councilman Kevin Bishop, on ordinance number 690. Yes, Mr. President, we uh, we uh, we vetted this piece of legislation in the municipal services and properties, and we uh, we support it. Great. Thank you. This was relieved by Development Planning Sustainability. Chairman Brancatelli is not with us. Further questions, comments on Ordinance Number Six Ninety Twenty Twenty One. Seeing no questions, Ordinance Number Six Ninety Twenty Twenty One stands approved. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Moving to economic development, please. Are you, Director? Uh, good afternoon. Okay, I have ordinance number 759-2021 by Councilmembers McCormick, Brancatelli, and Kelly by departmental request. An emergency ordinance authorizes the Mayor and Commissioner of Prits and Supplies to acquire and reconvey properties presently owned by Skyline Investment, Inc., or its designee, located 24 Public Square for the purpose of entering into chain of title prior to the adoption of tax increment financing legislation authorized under section 5709.41 of the revised code for the Hotel Cleveland project. Direct. Thank you. This uh, is the first uh, ordinance that would authorize a non-school TIF. It authorizes us to enter into uh, the chain of title for the property. The project is the renovation of the Renaissance Hotel downtown. Um, this is a uh, almost a $56 million project um, that's been proposed to uh, 
modernize and, and refresh that hotel. Um, it, it's, it's important in that it'll give us another uh, top class event space quality hotel in Cleveland. Um, right now really only um, the Hilton and the Marriott uh, kind of meet that top of market standard that we're, we're looking for. It'll help support uh, the development of the Sherwin-Williams headquarters um, and the activities there um, will be just across the street. And uh, most importantly, it, it'll help uh, retain uh, 69 people that work there and, and uh, lead to the creation of 166 jobs um, at the project site. So um, this is a really uh, key uh, property located within the city. Um, we're excited that the development team is, is uh, taking it on and, and modernizing it. Uh, the value of the, um, of the incentive is, is a little bit short of three and a half million dollars. Um, the rough impact is of the taxes is $315,000 a year. Um, and again, it's, it's a historic property. Um, they're also uh, using historic tax credits um, and, a, and a massive infusion of equity um, by the developer. So excited to be supporting the project and, and bringing it forward today. Thank you. So the, uh, I know this is the case, but I was going to hear. Um, so this is the chain of title um, legislation. There will be a follow-up piece of legislation that actually authorizes the TIP. But Correct. This is the authority to enter chain of title um, for this project. And um, this is uh, a project. This was routed to development planning sustainability. It's been relieved by the chairman. He's not here. The other sponsor is Councilman Kerry McCormick. Do you have any comments on 759-2021? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, no, I support this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions, comments on 759-2021? Councilman Mike Polensic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, my honorable colleagues. I, I'm just trying to get something clear here to the director. Is this new ownership? Yes, or is it's, it, it's new ownership. So it's not yes. just a refinancing, it's new Correct. ownership. Correct, it's new ownership and $56 million in new investment into the building. And that's the six million is for the renovation? 56 million. 56, yes, I see renovation. six million dollar, oh, the payroll is six million, okay, yeah. gotcha. And this should be completed when? Um, I think it's about an 18 month renovation, but I'll double check that. Okay, so the name of the hotel will change? Yes. And it will be called the? Go back to the Hotel Cleveland, which my understanding is, is the original name of that, that hotel when it first, hotel first Cleveland. came in. Okay, gotcha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Brian Casey. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, to the director, this is just the um, title for the chain this is not the TIF portion yet, correct? Correct. And then when we come back, Mr. President, the director, you'll have all my answers. Yeah, I, uh, I kind of ran through them, but I've got them We'll wait, until, here, we'll so wait yes. until the TIF portion of it, but um, I just want to make sure that we're not going for the TIF portion today. That is it's correct. Just, okay, sure. thank you, Mr. President. Anything further on 759-2021? Seeing no further questions, ordinance number 759-2021 stands approved. Okay, thank you. Thank you, director. Uh, public safety, please. Going, director. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, I've got two ordinances here. Ordinance number 652, 2021. By council members, Griffin and Kelly, by departmental request, an emergency ordinance to amend section two of ordinance number 202-2020, passed March 23rd, 2020, relating to a requirement contract for the purchase of turnout gear to add additional fund numbers. Director. Thank you, President. Uh, the rest of council. Uh, this is a uh, 652. Ordinance number 652-2021, it passed by council, would amend ordinance number 202-2020, authorizing the Director of Public Safety to enter into one or more requirements contracts for turnout gear for the Division of Fire Department of Public Safety for a term of one year with two-year options to renew to add additional bond funds. The additional funding for the turnout gear will be funded through uh, capital project funds that were identified in 2021. This funding will enable the Division of Fire to continue the rotational replacement of turnout gear for fire personnel. And just as an FYI, this is the, the, the turnout gear is the, um, is the gear that the firefighters put on to combat fire to keep themselves secure in high temperature environments. Thank you. So does this ordinance, we're amending the ordinance to add additional fund numbers. Yes. Is that just a different pool that it's coming from? Or is there more money added to the, to the turnout 
purchase or the there, there's I believe there was funds that were, were identified is to allocate those funds to for the purchasing of turnout gear how much more to, to allocate funds for the purchasing of the turnout gear this is uh, this is funds that have been identified that's in the um, that's in the capital project funds okay for to, to allocate it for turnout gear okay there's no uh, there's no uh, estimated cost in the certificate of funds on the legislation. So do you know what the number is? I believe the anticipated cost is approximately 300000 Okay. Um, in addition to what was passed in March, thir March of 2020? Correct, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, this was uh, heard and recommended for passage by Committee on Public Safety. I'd like to hear from the, the chairman of that committee, Councilman Blaine Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's been fully vetted and heard in public safety. I support this legislation. Thank you. Further questions, comments on 652-2021? Councilman Kevin Conwell? Yeah. Uh, I just don't know that, that world. What, what is to the chair, director? How you doing? Turnout doing. gear. What is turnout gear? Turnout gear, it's, it's the, uh, the heavy gear that when you see that firefighters put on to help them protect themselves in high temperature, the, um, the, the, uh, the overall suit, the pants, the jacket, yeah, no, the helmet, no, the, um, the fitted um, yes. mask. Okay. Yes. I see the gear. Thank yes. you. Thank you for Thank that. You. Uh, we need that. Yep. I'm there. I'm there 100%. Thank you. Ordinance number 652 stands approved. Ordinance number 660, 2021. Council members Griffin and Kelly by departmental request. An emergency ordinance authorizing the purchase by one or more contracts of a propane fire training system and various training props for the Division of Fire, Department of Public Safety for a period of one year with two one year options to renew exercisable by the Director of Public Safety. Director? Thank you. Ordinance number 660 2021, if passed by Council, will authorize the Director of Public Safety to enter into a contract for a propane fired training system with various training props for the Division of Fire, Department of Public Safety for a term of one year with two year, uh, two one year options to renew, exercisable by the Director of Public Safety. Propane fire training props burn cleanly and produce little to no pollution. Propane fire training props are also safer than some of the other types, types of training props and the propane training prop will have a uh, what's called a kill switch that will stop the fire instantaneous, instantaneously due to unexpected results during the training. This training system will enable the Division of Fire to provide more realistic and challenging training experiences to our firefighters. Thank you. Pretty straightforward. This ordinance has been heard and recommended mm -hmm. for passage by the Committee on Public Safety. I'd like to hear from Chairman Councilman Blaine Griffin, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. I'm fully vetted and heard. I support this legislation. Further questions, comments, and ordinance number 660-2021. Hearing on ordinance number 660-2021 stands approved. Thank, thank you, you, Director. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before the Director leaves, I have a Yeah, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and my colleagues. To the Director. This morning, we, the Councilman, um, to discuss, um, had a uh, discussion about the ARPA funds and as it pertains to the utilization of those funds and targeting um, critical areas. Um, I understand the administration, uh, every department, every division was, was asked to put together um, uh, a wish list or a priority list. Uh, does the Department of Public Safety, Division of Police, Fire, and EMS, do you have a list as it pertains to the overall condition of the vehicles and what vehicles need to be, frontline vehicles need to be replaced? Uh, Councilman, through, uh, through the uh, president, I do not have a list. I can get the list for you, um, but as I stand here, I don't have a list here. Okay, I wouldn't. I wouldn't accept. I wouldn't expect you to have one. I wonder if you could provide that um, through the chair to John James, because as when we get into discussions about funding, um, when I looked at the um, survey that the administration did, um, part of the response and the number one response that came back was obviously public safety, but a part of that was to. Um, this is from our citizens to replace frontline apparatus that was in either poor or bad condition. So as we get into the discussions, I'd like to know for sure, I'd like to know exactly, you know, what the needs are of police, fire, EMS as it pertains to our frontline equipment. I know we have some EMS vehicles that need to be replaced due to their age and mileage, but I'd like to see that overall 
uh, conditionless. So when we make decisions, uh, we're making the right decisions based on our, our needs. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, re I re uh, request that through you, and uh, hopefully that information can come to John James. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Director, thank you. Uh, at this point, I'm going to uh, begin our discussion on ordinance number 844-2021. So whomever is here for 844-2021, please join. Damn, blast from the past. Gentlemen, how are we? Great to good, see you. Good, see you again, good. Jim. Um, again, let me just, uh, if you weren't tuned in for the first part of the meeting, um, please be advised that today is the start of the conversation. Uh, this will then go through the committee process and there will be additional opportunities to ask questions, to opine on this. But uh, since it was just introduced, I wanted to take the first opportunity that I had a committee meeting to just put it in the public consciousness a little bit further in terms of what are we doing, what are we moving forward, and then we can just figure out what questions we need to answer between now and the time that we take a vote on this. So with that, I know that a tremendous amount of work has gone into this agreement. I appreciate everybody's uh, you know, diligence and patience in getting this done. And at this point, I'd like to um, start with, um, you know, what is you know, tell us about this agreement that is the subject matter of 844-2021, um, and what are the, you know, what are the specifics, and I know that there's more information that will, that will come forth as it goes through the committee process, but give us the top line. Give us what we need to know to get started. Okay, to the, to the chairman and the rest of the committee, this is a 15-year uh, lease with the Cleveland Indians. Um, this will start January 2022 and runs through December 2036. Um, the, the total uh, city commitment over that time frame would be a total of 116 million over the 15 years. Um, there's different funding sources. One is uh, uh, yeah, speak right in the mic there. We're sorry, the 15-year uh, total commitment is 116 million f for the city. Um, 3.2 million to fund the sports facility reserve, 2 million a year for the, from the parking of the Gateway East parking garage that's over there by the Indian Stadium. 50% uh, of the, um, the emissions tax for the, for the team, which is estimated to be 2.5 million. Uh, garage, Gateway East garage naming rights, which is 333,000 per year. And there's 350,000 to be determined that, that, to uh, close the gap for the entire deal. The entire project. Yes. Okay. And then, what is the what is the county's portion? What is the just generally speaking? Oh, okay. I'm not sure. Can you know it is? No, it's higher. But I'm... Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the council, uh, the viewing public. My name is Ken Silliman. I am a, uh, I am the chairman of the Gateway Economic Development Corporation of Greater Cleveland. Uh, I am what we call a joint appointee, uh, and that's how I derive my chair chairmanship. Uh, in in other words, I was nominated by. Uh, Mayor Frank Jackson, and by County Executive Armin Budish, and confirmed by this council, as well as the Cuyahoga County Council. Um, many of the council members probably know what I'm about to say, but uh, I know there's members of the viewing public. I going to take a minute and describe what kind of an animal gateway is. I'll start by saying there is often confusion because my uh, nonprofit corporation is in charge of the uh, gateway site where the ballpark and the field house are located. But there is also an entity, uh, the uh, historic gateway Neighborhood Development Corporation. Actually, uh, Tom Yablonski is just retired as director of that mm -hmm. entity. We often get confused. So the group I represent is responsible for managing the sports complex. 
the group that Tom represents is responsible for the neighborhood development actions around the sports complex. Um, the predecessor of Gateway was something called the Greater Cleveland Dome Stadium Corporation. It was formed in the 1980s for the purpose of acquiring a site for a future uh, sports complex, and that was uh, successfully accomplished. Uh, when the voters of Cuyahoga County passed the original sin tax in 1990, Gateway's role evolved from just being a property owner to also becoming a landlord. Specifically, Gateway leased what became the ballpark and the arena to the respective teams and uh, has been in that capacity ever since. Now, Gateway has no independent source of funding. Um, so although uh, Gateway took a significant role in the negotiations that I'm about to describe, we, we remained in constant contact with represent, representatives of City Hall as well as Cuyahoga County because we are obviously dependent on them for the dollar amounts that you will soon hear about. Um, okay. Um, now, Gateway does have operating expenses, several million a year. Uh, pursuant to the existing leases with the teams, the teams actually split those operating expenses as a form of rent. So, as uh, Mr. Gentile explained, uh, what we are describing for you uh, today is a proposed 15-year lease to keep the, the ball club here through the end of 2036. Now, the existing lease was due to expire, is due to expire in, at the end of 2023. Uh, what you will see is that we are proposing that we uh, basically start this 15-year clock uh, effective at the end of, at the beginning of 2022, assuming if, if, and it's a big if, if this council and the county council approve the funding sources. That means that we would be substituting the first two years of this 15-year lease for the last two years of the existing lease. So net, net, we are actually only adding 13 years to the lease. Now, the reason for that, as you will hear later on, is that there are a number of significant ballpark improvements contemplated by our proposed agreement, and it's in everyone's interest to start the construction process for those as soon as possible, and without the new funding sources, that would not be possible. Ken, before you go further, um, I don't know if this is part of your presentation, but uh, one thing when you described, and just stop me if you're going to talk about this later, but when you described the relationship between Gateway and, and Progressive Field, um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way that the lease is structured, that in the event that there is no tenant, the city of Cleveland is the backstop for that, that ballpark. And we would be responsible for everything if, if there was no tenant and it sat empty, you know, up to including, I'm not even going to say the word, but the, the, the D word if we had to take it down. But we would be, that would be our property to manage, just like the county is the backstop for the queue. Is that accurate? Mr. Chairman, that is precisely accurate. Okay. So I think we need to always to go into this knowing that this is really the city's financial responsibility in the event that there is no tenant and of everything right. moving forward. That's correct. Okay. Just want to, I, I don't know if you're going to say that, but I think that's a, uh, a critical part of our inquiry. All right. Uh, now I'm going to describe what Gateway is recommending in order to keep the Indians, actually now the Guardians, a tenant uh, for, through the end of 2036. And it's expensive. There's no other way to describe it. It would involve $19 million a year public funding for each of the next 15 years. Now, that's divided 
uh, amongst uh, Cuyahoga County, which would shoulder nine million a year. The city of Cleveland, again, subject to council approval, uh, for eight million a year. And many of you may have heard uh, Governor DeWine's uh, press conference in early August, where Governor DeWine indicated that he would support state funding for two million a year. So adding all that together, uh, nine million from the county, eight million from the city, two million from the state, 19 million a year. Now that money goes exclusively, actually, back to your point, Mr. Chairman, to preserve and improve the ballpark. In other words, it's not going towards operating expenses. It's not going to pay a shortstop salary or anything. It's going to the building. And it's going in two ways. We say preserve and improve. By preserve, we mean fixing what's already there. If you think of your home uh, and, and you're a homeowner, you know that maybe every 20 years or so you need to fix, replace the roof. Maybe every 10 years you need to replace the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, if you have air conditioning. Uh, you need to replace the plumbing once a while. Well, a ballpark on a much grander scale is no different. In other words, everything you see out there today is subject to uh, you know, a maintenance schedule, and sooner or later, the parts that are there wear out and they need to be replaced. We call those capital repairs, fixing what's already there. Now, of the 19 million a year, 8 million annually would go towards capital repairs. Things like ele elevators, escalators, HVAC, uh, concrete, the seats, um, even the scoreboard. And uh, now, when we say 8 million a year, that's not just pulled out of the air, because Gateway, in, um, in conjunction with the ball club, um, developed a long-term facility assessment to determine what's likely to come up over time. And we have that assessment, and the eight million a year corresponds pretty closely with what that assessment says we will be needing over the next 15 years. Um, now, preserving is one piece. Improving is another piece. Let's go back to the home analogy. If you're really looking at maximizing the value of your home, you're doing more than just fixing what's there. You're also looking out with emerging trends. You know, what's the latest kitchen designs? Are people now adding back decks onto their properties? Are they, how, how are they doing their, their bathrooms these days? Under those category of things, again, looking to the ballpark, we call those improvements or enhancements. Those are things that over time make sure that our facility is keeping up with other facilities across the league. Why is that important? Because it keeps our existing facility relevant, in good condition, and it avoids what cities such as Atlanta and Arlington, Texas have recently faced, and that's a billion dollar price tag for a brand new ballpark. And it's not just those cities. Um, uh, right now, Oakland is struggling with an $855 million issue. Uh, Buffalo uh, and its football stadium is going through this discussion. And even uh, Chicago, there's talk of a new suburban football stadium in Arlington Heights. Billion dollar price tags. By investing in our existing asset and making sure not only that everything's working properly, but that we're keeping it contemporary, we're maximizing the chance over time that the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County will not have to tackle that kind of a billion dollar uh, 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 facility. Now, uh, 
uh, I said the capital improvements are $8 million a year. The public would, uh, again, under our proposed uh, agreement, would contribute $11 million towards ball ballpark improvements. Addis additionally, the baseball team, the Guardians, have committed an additional $4.5 million a year. Uh, and you add those two together, and those two pots of money can fund a $200 million uh, upgrade of our facility. And when, Mr. Chairman, you alluded to future discussions, we won't cover it today, but um, eventually when we have more time and you've had the opportunity and your colleagues have to study the financial part of that, we have representatives of the, Cle of the Cleveland Guardians that will be able to go over in some level of detail what those 200 million worth of improvements <coughs> will be. Uh, now the fin city, proposed city sources, Mr. Gentile described, either of us can uh, answer any questions about those. Uh, the county funding sources, um, the first source already exists, and that's the uh, existing sin tax, which runs through the year 2034. Uh, and that was passed by the voters back in 2014 to keep the, to contribute towards capital repairs for all three major sports facilities. First Energy Stadium, owned by the city of Cleveland, and the two gateway facilities owned by Gateway. Um, and uh, that sin tax will support, when you well, all the dust settles from the bond issues the county's done already. That will support two and a half million a year contribution from the county. So that's county source number one. County source number two is basically a match for, for the proposal that the city contribute 50% of the admission tax. Uh, that, as Mr. Gentile indicated, would be about two and a half million a year. The county's proposing to match that. And the last county source was enabled by a action the county took back in 2019 <coughs> when they passed a 1% bed tax increase. And that was always envisioned to support two things, some uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame expenses and the price tag for a new uh, ballpark. So that will put three million a year towards the uh, 19 million. Um, um, I, I won't get into it today, but um, w as you have the opportunity to go through the term sheet, the proposed term sheet that I passed out, you'll see a table on page three, and that sets forth what the, um, what the kind of ongoing expenses uh, are going to be and who contributes what. Uh, you know, just summarizing, uh, 19 million a year from the public, uh, 10 million from the team. So about a two-thirds, one-third ratio. You will see that the team's contributions, in, separate and apart from the four and a half million towards the ballpark enhancement, the team's uh, contributions go mainly towards ongoing operation type things. While the public contributions, as I've said before, go towards the building itself. Lastly, um, when, when, we, uh, when we approached Governor DeWine about helping out with the two million a year, uh, he made clear that he wanted to see some extension options added to our, our proposed agreement. And uh, as a result, and you'll see this described on page three or four of the term sheet, there are two five-year extension options that can be triggered uh, provided certain conditions are met. Uh, the first five years that would take it from 2036 to 2041 would, can be triggered if the public commits to two sources of funding, nine million a year towards capital repairs for those last five years, and basically about 14 million a year towards an additional round of ballpark improvements, which would then fund, go towards a $67.5 million bond uh, 
issue at that time. <coughs> the last five-year option is more vague just because uh, you're going, uh, it would cover the period 2041 to 2046. And to project any kind of numbers that far out in the future just doesn't make sense. So it's, it's a more generally defined option. But it leaves open the possibility that the city, the county, Gateway, and the team could agree to an additional uh, five-year option. So that is uh, admittedly a somewhat lengthy summary, but I wanted to make sure I covered all the nuances. And uh, Mr. Gentile and myself are open for any questions. Uh, great. Thank you. Did you have anything further, Jim? No, no, that's good. Thank you. Ken, Ken got it. Okay. Great. No, I just want to, uh, you know, I, I have the, I'm fortunate enough to have been, uh, you know, apprised, a briefed on certain sta um, steps in negotiation. So I feel I, under I know this pretty well. But I think the, really the, you know, the main issue is, you know, there is a cost to, to doing nothing, and we have to just assess that and the fact that this is the city of Cleveland's asset. At the end, although Gateway is the owner, the title owner, um, that the city of Cleveland is the responsible financial party. So, um, so this is going to be a good discussion moving forward. Um, I think we just all need to understand the the, the gravity of this of this proposal, of this ordinance, of this lease, and what it means to the future of the city of Cleveland. And we will have many more of these discussions, and we'll be getting more in depth at every level. So this was a very good summary to get us started. We do have a couple questions for you. I want to begin with uh, Majority Leader Blaine Griffin, please. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, I think, Mr. Chairman, I think you got somebody. Okay. Um, I think that it's uh, critical, first of all, for the public and the listening audience to know that this is going to be more than just sports teams and more than just um, million dollar owners. I know that a lot of people are going to try to boil it down to that, but I'm really interested in if we could really understand the economic impact and how this is, um, you know, about workers and, and, and what kind of things that uh, we will benefit from actually um, that would help our local economy by this coming in place. So I really hope that we can get some of that data. But to uh, start off, a couple of things that I just would like to ask, and I've been really reading up on some of these deals. Um, one of the deals that I've read up on is Seattle. And just a couple of things, if I look at the Carolina Panthers, I think they put forth about a $14 million subsidy. San Jose, had about a 12 million. Atlanta was about 7 million. Tampa Bay Lightning Stadium was about 7 million. How did we get to the 19 million and how is this comparable to other cities? If I could start out with that, Mr. Chair, to the uh, group. Through the chair, to Councilman Griffin, um, uh, you've obviously done your homework. Um, the 19 million uh, took a long time for the, uh, for the administration of, of the city and the administration of the <coughs> county to get to. Um, we, we are familiar with this, the comparables you indicate. Uh, Seattle, when you, when you uh, kind of, uh, when all the dust settles, works out to about 10 and a half million a year from the, from the public sector. Um, the, in our view, the main comparables here are not those cities, but rather the cities that had made the decisions that their facilities were 25 years old and it was time to replace them. And again, those cities were Atlanta, um, which uh, their, their price tag was just not quite a billion of which the public bore the, the primary burden. Um, the um, uh, Arlington, Texas, uh, and their, their billion dollar new stadium uh, carries a public price tag of about 25 million a year. Uh, Oakland right now is going through extensive negotiations with the Oakland A's and Major League Baseball. Uh, the price tag that has been set by both the ball club and the 
uh, uh, Commissioner Manfred, uh, Major League Baseball Commissioner, is $855 million. Um, and that comes out to an awful lot more than what we have uh, in, fr uh, in front of you at this point. Um, I don't want to minimize the, uh, the price tag. $19 million is a is a lot to pay. But it, it, as you will see when we do give the presentations that you mentioned on both the specifics of the ballpark improvements, the impact on the neighborhood, and Tom Yablonski will be here to review the impact of the sports facilities on, on that gateway neighborhood. Uh, the team will present its own economic and community impact data as well. Um, that the investment now in making an already good ballpark uh, better and more able to continue to be competitive through the years and avoid that large new expenditure, that it ultimately is a good investment. Okay. And I'm looking forward to hearing from Tom Yablonski and the team because really um, I've already begun speaking with some members and I'm really trying to educate my community on these uh, economic impacts. I think that the narrative is going to have to be changed because already it's going to become about the owners and you know the ball clubs but we really need to drill down on what is the economic impact so hopefully you can have that a couple of things mr chairman because i want to understand the the um this process and no better person to really understand it than uh my chief i always call him he's my chief ken silliman never bring a problem without a solution i always learned that from him. <laughs> um but um i really want to understand the mechanics of the deal seattle also got a nice return on their investment they actually got um repaid with interest it wasn't just um them getting their bond repaid they actually got paid with interest does this deal um repay with interest to the city and the county or is it just um, how is that return on investment? Is it going to be interest or, or is it not going to be interest? Well, um, th through the chair to, to Councilman Griffin, um, if, if you're talking about the interest payments on proposed bond issues, um, there, the, the, there, it gets kind of complicated, but when all the dust settles, the team is helping out with that. Um, not not all of it, um, and it's 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 basically a divided responsibility. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but it helps. And believe me, Chief, we're going to spend a lot of time on this, so I don't okay. expect to have yeah. all of the complicated mathematical problems worked out today. But I do want to have basic, fundamental understanding so that I can be able to talk with the public about, you know, as I deliberate making my decision. The other thing that I have is that football makes most of their money from national broadcasts, um, from some of the research that I did. However, basketball, hockey, and uh, baseball seems like most of their money gets made from ticket sales. How did that impact your decision-making process? Through the chair to Councilman Griffin, um, um, football benefited from some decisions that then Commissioner Pete Rozelle made in the 1960s. Uh, at the very time that TV as a substantial viewing audience and money maker for the sports teams was developing and flexing its muscles. Um, Commissioner Roselle was able to get the, the owners of the National Football League teams to agree that they would share equally in all television contracts, everything. And as a result, there are no haves and have-nots in pro football when it comes to substantial TV revenues. It's basically leveled out. And, and uh, um, Councilman, you're absolutely right. The other sports leagues have tried to get more uh, towards that model. Uh, most, I th you know, the gentleman behind me can be more specific when we have the longer sessions, but what I recall is that it was a major issue 
uh, when the last significant baseball strike occurred in terms of revenue sharing, the big market, uh, you know, the New Yorks and the Bostons and the, that have the, the regional TV networks that do not uh, share equally. Um, and as a result, it puts those teams in a vastly superior competitive position because they get those kind of revenues. There are some national baseball TV revenues that are shared, things like the All-Star Game and I think the World Series. But, but the, the run-of-the-mill local games are largely uh, you know, a function of the local TV contracts, which vary significantly from market to market. Okay. Thank you, Chief. That's very important. Two other questions, Mr. Chair, and then I'll yield my time. The other thing that I would like to understand is how did you get to the five years? Is this a team option or a city option? Um, and then also, could you help me understand uh, with this if, um, you know, from a community benefit stand standpoint, or, you know, how do we try to strengthen the deal to make sure that there's no, that there's no, you know, that there's not a lot of loopholes that we actually have an opportunity to strengthen our position. I think it was Jerry Reinsdorf that is always saying you always look for leverage as a city um, when you're doing these types of deals. So I'm trying to understand, um, is it a city opt out or is it a team option for the other five years? And then also, are there any loopholes? And then I have one more question and then um, I go from there, Mr. Chair. Uh, through the chair to Councilman Griffin, the, the what we call a vesting lease option is an option in favor of the public sector. In other words, they, 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 there's a condition, a, a significant condition, and that is the public sector has to show bef well in advance of the expiration of the existing 15 years that they have the resources to fund $9 million a year towards capital repairs and a $67.5 million bond issue, which is paid by about 14 million towards ballpark improvements. So if in say year 2030, the city and county get together and they say, well, we've cobbled together a funding plan that can guarantee those streams of revenue, then they give notice to the team and the team is obliged to extend the lease five years uh, and uh, subject to those monies coming forward. Okay. And it's the same thing on the last five years. It's, it's an option in favor of the public sector. As far as community benefits, that is, uh, again, a significant part of our full presentation. Uh, we will describe to you uh, how Gateway was a signatory to uh, Mayor Jackson's community benefits standard agreement back about five or six years ago and that uh, since that time, major gateway projects, the most recent being the Q project, uh, uh, have adhered to those standards in, as far as um, uh, minority business employment, female business employment, uh, percentage of city residents employed, and other attributes of those community benefit agreements. Uh, additionally, both gateway and the team have been in discussions with the Cuyahoga County Committee on Equity, which is equally concerned with those kind of topics. And they've recommended things on both gateway operating procedures and ball club operating procedures as far as procurement, so that we're not just talking about construction, but we're talking about other types of procurement and how do you how do you open up your process and communicate opportunities better than we've done in the past? And we'll, we'll describe those to you when we have a more full presentation. And Chief, I, I know that we have our own group that's also meeting around those equitable issues and you actually um, beat me to my last question, which is community benefits. And I'm reading this document right here that is very interesting about how we make sure we get good community benefits. But I am interested in local hiring and 
buying, uh, making sure that we have MBE, FBE participation, and we do want to understand those numbers, not just from a construction standpoint. I do want to make sure that we understand what kind of wages the workers will be having. Um, you know, everybody from the hot dog vendors, not just the executives, but, you know, are the hot dog vendors and those guys making 15 an hour, or what are they making? Um, you know, are, what kind of workers do we have? Um, restoring fields in our neighborhoods, we know that that's critical. Lead is important, child care. So we have some different neighborhood um, issues that I really would like to understand. And in some cities, I know to accomplish some of that, they often put a $1 surcharge and other things. So um, just as I vet this and being the advocate for my community, I really hope that we have clear things of what the community will benefit for on this. And once again, I hope that this conversation becomes one of an economic impact for our community and not just about rich sports owners. This is about how viable of an economic opportunity and tool is this for our community. And I hope that this council really looks at it from that lens um, so that it doesn't get boiled down to um, let's just give more money to rich ball club owners. I think that the Dolan family and others do a lot for our community, um, but I really want to understand what the community benefit would be. So thank you so much, Chief, and I really might have other conversations for you. You know I have your number, so I hope we can spend more time on this. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Mike Polenzik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, my honorable colleagues. It's glad to see uh, Ken back in the table. It reminds me of <laughs> Holder guys. You're back, okay? You're back. Um, let, me, uh, let me just say this. I look forward, Mr. Chairman, to the, a lengthy discussion because uh, since the original Gateway discussion at this table, uh, our world has changed in Cleveland. So the team owners, not just the Indians, uh, but of the Cavaliers and the Browns, because if they were at this table, I'd be asking the same question. Um, I, re I retain a lot of stuff. My office certainly reflects it. I've got all the literature from the Gateway Drive. Uh, the promises of 28,000 full-time jobs downtown. Um, all the other perks that we were supposed to receive that we haven't. Um, I was told, as Blaine Griffin, as my alma colleague brought about all these community benefits we are going to be derived from. Um, and that's a very short list, I can assure you, over all these years. So when we get into this discussion, and just let me lay the foundation from my perspective. Um, Cleveland, number one in poverty, number one in childhood poverty, 4,000 abandoned houses, sixth in violent crime. Um, we're down 150 police officers. Uh, we've lost the equivalency of two wards two wards in the last decade. So we're gonna be asked again uh, to support uh, a major funding project for a, a sporting venue. And I'm gonna be asking some very, very pointed questions when, when the Indians come to the table, like, tell me what you've done, the follow-up on Blaine's line of questioning. I wanna know what you guys have done, and I wanna know in the course of all these years, and I'm the only one left here, I'm the last of the Mohicans to play off the Indians thing, okay? I'm it. I remember all the commitments made at the table. I understand the promises made at the table. I got them all written down. I got all the pamphlets. And yet, today in the city of Cleveland, look what we're dealing with. Massive disparity, massive unemployment, um, I, I could just go down the list and list. And as you know, um, you know, I'm a pretty conservative guy. And, but I am not going to ignore, and I refuse to ignore the obvious. I'm not going to ignore the poverty. I'm not going to ignore the lack of opportunity. And I'm not going to ignore the promises that were made to us and never delivered upon. So when, when you folks come to the table, I will tell you, come prepared. I want to know what you've done. 
I want to know as it pertains to your hiring practices. I want to know what to what, as you've heard from some my, and you heard from other colleagues, what you're paying your folks. And I want to know by us supporting this, by, if, if this council is to support this, what are the real benefits going to be? Not the boogeyman stuff. Not the stuff that we threw out as one of the most prominent businessmen in this city who was a, a pro big promoter of the Gateway Project. And I asked him, because I was friends with him, I asked him years later, I said, what about the 28,000 jobs you promised? He said, well, that's what we had to say to, to get the thing passed. We had to promise that. But we knew in reality it was only going to be about 2,800 jobs. <coughs> See, that's the crap that's been pulled around to us in this city. One thing is being told to us, and then reality the reality that we experience is not the same. So are, are we all supporters of the, of, of the sporting venues in this city? Of course we are. I grew up in Cleveland, never lived anyplace else. But at the end of the day, our citizens, our kids have got a benefit. Our neighborhoods have got a benefit. And don't tell me you gave me some, some baseball field out in the neighborhood where you got massive poverty all around it. That ain't going to cut it with me. Don't, give me a, don't give me a baseball field. Don't mean nothing to me. I want to know how it equates to jobs, quality of life, improving the environment for our, our families and our children in this city. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I refuse, well, I didn't buy it last time. Um, and I, I, got, I got to tell you, I'm not here to fight with people. I'm not here to be in an adversarial role with anyone. But, um, but the, the, the team owners, the team owners better understand what we're dealing with today in 2021. It's a different world in Cleveland, a world that I never thought I'd see. I never thought I'd see the poverty that I see. You talk about improving your, your building and keeping it well maintained. I support that, just like I support maintaining City Hall. But a, a week ago when I got that crappy rain, we got that rain, I had over 12 people call me, elderly, whose roofs were leaking, and they can't afford to fix their roofs. They can't afford to fix their houses. I got families working poor that are struggling every day just to keep that roof over there or to maintain their structure. So do I want to see the Indians facility, progressive field maintained? Of course, of course I do, like every other city building. So at the end of the day, be prepared for a very interesting committee hearing, a long discussion, and you, and you can't give us, don't give us the stuff that is not real. You know, I'd rather, you know, I, I don't, I'm at a point in my life that whether it's good or bad news, I just want the accurate news. Abraham Lincoln said, uh, history is not history unless it's, the, it's less it's honest. And I, I got a history, I got a history here. And, and, and we've been misled, the body has been misled repeatedly on these sports complexes and what we're to derive from them in this city. So, my friend, I look upon you as a friend, even though we haven't always agreed <clears throat> at times. You've got to be upfront with us. You've got to be forthwith. And you've got to recognize what the men and women at this table are dealing with every day. Despair, poverty, lack of opportunity, and people too many people talking with their feet and leaving our city because they don't believe anything's changing here. I've lived in a city all my whole life. This is a great town with great opportunities. The team owners have to be partners with us. Have to be partners with us. And if they become true partners with us, then we can make significant changes in this city. But they have to understand what we're dealing with today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Kevin Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Steelman, um, of course, I, haven't, I wasn't around when the uh, other um, uh, deals were negotiated with the other teams, so I, I don't have the historical perspective as, as my colleague, uh, Mr. Polensic. But I, I just want some clarification so I can, I can understand what's being asked here. Um, so the Gateway owns um, the baseball park and basically, we, the city and the county is the landlord, correct? Uh, through, the, through the chair, the councilman, Bishop, 
Uh, Gateway owns the ballpark. Gateway owns the arena. But as the chairman uh, indicated earlier, if those tenants ever leave, then there's provisions that the ballpark reverts to the city of Cleveland and the city becomes the owner and the uh, arena now called the field house reverts to the county and the county becomes the owner. Okay, through the chair. So <clears throat> how much does the um, Indians pay in, as far as rent uh, other than its operate, the operating expenses? Do they pay anything back into the Gateway uh, Corporation? Through the chair to Councilman Bishop, uh, indirectly they do in the form, if you want to consider an admission tax, an indirect form of rent, uh, they do pay admission tax, as do the Browns, as do the Cavaliers, as do Playhouse Square Theaters. Um, in, in 2019, for example, they paid about five, a little over five million in admission tax. But, but it, uh, other than that admission tax and other than the gateway operating expenses, no, they, they don't pay rent. So the, the analogy that you use um, with, with a home, for instance, um, and you, you're saying that you have to um, upgrade your home and look at different trends in the market. Uh, so the analogy used for that really doesn't reflect this situation here because the Indians really don't pay rent, correct? Through the chair to, to uh, Councilman Bishop, um, they, they are a tenant uh, of Gateway. Um, they pay, uh, yeah, as I said, rent in the form of operating expenses. But if you're making a comparison to like a typical residential lease um, arrangement, it's, it's, it's probably, they don't remit a check it's probably to apples and oranges. But they don't remit a check to Gateway. No, for a lease. no. So, so yeah, so, so the, the point of w w the analogy that you made um, is, is that we, we, we have to upkeep our property, but at the same time, our tenants basically gets to, to basically dwell in our property um, rent free, so to speak, other than, other than the admissions tax. Well, um, in the proposed agreement before you, they're contributing a significant percentage towards enhancing the ballpark. Uh, they're contributing four and a half million a year. The public will be contributing 11 million a year. And that four and a half million a year is significant. Um, um, it, again, it plus the proposed public commitment would support a $200 million bond issue towards upgrading the, uh, the ballpark. Councilman, so, would you allow Councilman Jones a very quick point on what you just asked? No, nope, all good. Yeah, Councilman I'm Bishop, please continue. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, John. Go ahead, Councilman Jones. Mr. Chairman, um, he talked about um, the cost, and I know that we have three visitors in the back, and um, I didn't know, and just on that line of uh, questioning, what do the city of Cleveland get paid from um, the Indians currently right now on an annual basis well, to the uh, city? Through the chair to Councilman Jones, um, again, uh, we, we have a fuller presentation on economics um, <coughs> and to Councilman Polenzik's earlier point about hard, verifiable numbers. Um, uh, Cleveland State University did an economic study, and as far as direct taxes annually paid by the team to the city of Cleveland, it's somewhere in the uh, nine million annual range. Uh, that's primarily uh, admission taxes, uh, income taxes, and um, I forget the other hotel categories. Bed, is it hotel bed tax, parking taxes, admission taxes. Correct. And there's one more, and then sales, something sales tax. Sales Do we get to, okay. Yeah, you will see that 
in, yeah. in uh, full detail. Yeah. And oh. and again, I I know it's not uh, part of the agenda today for the team to present, but I, I'll at least introduce uh, uh, Joe Zendarsek is uh, general counsel to the Indians on the right, and Brian Barron is basically oversees yeah. all the business yeah. operations of the team on the left. And, and they then, present, they will be presenting uh, detailed information, uh, hard data on what the actual payments are. So and then Councilman Bishop, um, do you have another so, question? So we don't have a general idea of what, what we actually um, I'd get on the I'd rather not just spitball on that. I if want to get the hard number right, next I know. time. But if we have a general idea, because I don't know. So I'm asking if we have a preliminary, preliminary uh, estimate of how much does uh, the baseball pay in terms of lease leasing from us? Well, uh, th through, the, through the chair to, to Councilman Jones, uh, I spoke to just actual taxes paid to the city of Cleveland general fund because the, when, when they were doing their economic study, um, that was important to us at Gateway. I knew it would be important to you at the council table. And, and those are the numbers I know well. Yeah. They're going to get into some other numbers that I don't know off the top of my head, but they, they have a presentation on that, and you will see yeah, it. When, so, um, Councilman Bishop, can you allow Councilman Conwell one quick point just on taxes, and then we'll go back to you. <coughs> yes. Yeah, yes. It's, it's great to see you, Ken. When I pass by um, over there where Gateway is at, and I see the Indians and and I see all the people bringing their families to, to watch the Indians. And, and I see um, um, the families and people at hotels and, and, and the taxes, tax dollars they bring in. And they also they purchase. They go in and they buy lunch and they buy dinner for their families. And, and that area used to be dead when I was growing up as a kid. And the other thing that the Indians bring in also with the restaurants and the other businesses around there, they bring in money to that area. It's like a stimulus. It's like a stimulus dollars they bring there, where some of the um, businesses, I have people that's working in these businesses, they also pay payroll tax dollars to the city of Cleveland. So when you look at it, it's in a circular economy, it brings in more dollars than what you're talking about right now. Not just taxes, but it's also a stimulus dollars they bring into the city of Cleveland. Thank yes. you very much. That was my Thank comment. You. Thank you, Councilman Conwell. Back to Councilman Bishop. You have the floor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, to uh, Mr. Stillman, uh, if you, uh, in your opinion, uh, Mr. Stillman, what, what do you think the uh, useful life of a ballpark in, in general terms, what is the useful life of a ballpark in, in years, or so to speak? Through the chairman to uh, Councilman Bishop, that is an excellent question. I, I'll give you my best shot. Uh, if you look at what just happened in Atlanta and Arlington, Texas, those communities would tell you that the useful life of a ballpark is 20 to 25 years. Uh, and you, if you ask why they replace their ballparks at that, uh, at that age, they would say economic obsolescence or something to that effect. Um, but there are other examples. Um, now, these are privately owned ballparks, but if you look at Wrigley Field in Chicago or Fenway Park in Boston or even uh, uh, Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, uh, the first two are... Uh, are over 100 years old. Uh, Dodger Stadium is approaching 60 years old. Um, so in my view, and I do spend a lot of time looking at these kind of questions, in my view, if, 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 if the public sector is careful about preserving and keeping its facility competitive, there's no reason that a ballpark shouldn't have a useful life of at least 50 years or more. Um, and uh, those examples where, where, where 
facilities are replaced at the age 20 or 25, I think that there's a lot of, uh, well, uh, it doesn't have the latest in suites or uh, uh, premium seating areas or the layouts or, you know, uh, again, I, I, I submit that, that if it should be, and rightly should be, in excess of 50 years. And there are examples of well-preserved facilities that have done that. So, so the, through the chair, so the examples that you <clears throat> just, <clears throat> just mentioned, those were in markets where um, in prime, prime what we, what we want to say prime markets, is, is, that, is that safe to say? Or is it just middle of the road markets? Well, uh, if you're talking about the, the long, long term facilities, yes. So we're talking New York, Boston, and LA, those are prime markets. But if you go to football, the Green Bay Packers, uh, their stadium has been around like 75 years, and that nobody would consider Green Bay a prime market. So, okay. St. Louis, uh, so, uh, so, so we do. How old is Bush in St. Louis? Uh, well, Bush is relatively new. It's newer, it, but um, it, it went like through Camden. It went through different renovations. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. similar to similar to progressive. Okay, through the chair. Um, so at the end of now, the typical uh, run of the mill lease for a um, major league baseball team, so to speak, to. Um, to sign with a with a with a city or with a ballpark is typically how long? Is, do you have a, an assessment on that? Uh, through the chair to Councilman Bishop, I would say uh, 25 to 30 years would be a typical lease term. Some some are longer, but uh, I would say usually at a minimum it's 25 years. So you, so it's for safe a brand to say, new for a brand new facility. So through the chair, it's safe to say that this is a fairly short lease. Through the, through the chair to Councilman Bishop, it, 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 it is, but it's an existing facility that's approaching uh, its uh, uh, 25th, uh, well, it's actually uh, um, over 25 years old. Okay. And so, so Mr. Stillman, through the chair, um, now, at the end of this lease, at the end of this, this short lease, um, you say it's two extensions, five-year extensions, uh, but that involves more uh, dollars that the city would have to pay, the city and the county would have to pay yes. for renovations, or th that would be just mainly for renovations. Right. So, yeah. so in your assessment, would this, will we have to continue to renovate um, Progressive Field? from now until eternity for the Indians to actually want to stay in Cleveland and play in Cleveland. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Uh, through the chair to Councilman Bishop, uh, yes, uh, because, uh, again, um, um, if you're going to keep a facility in, in excellent condition, you've got as it ages, some of the replacements get more expensive over time. And you've, you've got to recognize that and build that in. And again, if you're going to stay competitive with other you know, newer venues that have opened and have different types of designs reflecting the, the current needs of, of the current uh, attendees at the ballpark, uh, if you're going to keep your facility relevant, you've got to be attuned to that, and you've got to improve it from time to time to make sure that it's still meeting the needs of the present day customer. Okay. All right. Through the chair, this, I guess this is my last question. Through the chair to Mr. Stillman. Um, now, I've seen uh, in other venues, or not necessarily ballparks, but in other arenas, where they had uh, multiple uses for these arenas, like the, um, the Cavalier Stadium, they have other things in, inside of the, uh, um, the Gund Arena. Um, but I've never seen anything other than the baseball be, being played at, at Progressive Field. 
is that by design or is that in the lease that we don't have multiple uses for this venue or can you explain that? Uh, through the chair to Councilman Bishop, uh, there was a period of time in the late 50s and 1960s where a whole host of cities were building uh, stadiums with the idea that they would be uh, jointly used by baseball and football. Uh, some of those cities included Milwaukee, St. Louis, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, um, and several others. Um, and uh, the problem with that is that the, the designs in terms of fan uh, friendliness, they're, they're really totally different. Uh, a football stadium is kind of long and narrow, um, and a baseball stadium is totally different in design. And starting with Camden Yards in, in Baltimore, which was the Baltimore Orioles is basically saying we want a baseball specific park. Um, other, other teams began asking the same and then the football teams picked up on the trend. They, that really started with our own situation in Cleveland when the team went to Baltimore and that's turned off a trend of football only stadiums and that. But I do think uh, even though even though a stadium that accommodates baseball and football is really obsolete by today's standards and you're not going to see that hardly ever again, that doesn't mean you can't use a uh, baseball stadium for other things. And uh, next year, Alton John is going to be pl playing at, at Progressive Field, am I right? Mm -hmm. yes. um, and I do think the team is getting more creative in terms of other types of opportunities. Uh, and that, again, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're always attend, if you're looking towards keeping your facility relevant, part of that is making it available for other types of uses. Okay, and through the chair, I know to say this was my last question, but through the chair to Mr. Stillman. Now, if say for instance, you, you mentioned some, who else was gonna use the stadium? Who else talk, to the team is talking to? Who did you say? Uh, at the at the ballpark, you mean? Uh huh. Uh, Elton John. Uh, okay. Con con okay. So so in that instance, uh, when when uh, when the ballpark is going to be used for another um, purpose, who actually gets the revenue for that? Will it be the team or will it be the gateway and ultimately the city of Cleveland? Um, through the chair to Councilman uh, Bishop, uh, the team gets that revenue. Um, now, it, under the original Gateway lease, Gateway got a percentage uh, of revenues, uh, but when, uh, when it became apparent in the early 2000s that Gateway didn't have the revenues to pay its operating expenses and property taxes, the lease was renegotiated, and, and now the team pays those operating expenses as a form of rent, but to get that arrangement, Gateway had to give up some of the upside revenue sharing, such as for events like that. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Brian Casey, and I knew that Bush was, I was thinking of the Royals for some reason, that Missouri thing. But uh, Councilman Brian Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's a, he, he's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, what, what was your last point? He thinks Kansas City's good. I don't know. Oh, no, it's an older stadium is what I was, uh, it's a- it's Royals, he's, he's well, talking Royal Stadium. No. <laughs> um, Mr. Chairman to uh, Chief Silliman, uh, I don't know, Ken or whatever, but it's, it's Chief Silliman. Uh, this first one, first question is gonna seem, I don't know, maybe a little absurd, but who are we entering into this contract with? Through the, through the chair to Councilman Casey, uh, the legislation before you authorizes the city of Cleveland to enter into a cooperative agreement. Um, that, the terms of that cooperative agreement are still being drafted at Cuyahoga County, but um, it would essentially provide for 
a, um, for the city of Cleveland to, to make payments from the funding sources that Mr. Gentile described to a trustee. The trustee would collect those payments from the city of Cleveland and then also collect the payments that I described that the county is making and collect all of those. And then from that trust account, you would do the bond issue for the, for the improvements mm -hmm. and you would also pay for the annual $8 million in capital repair. So technically mm -hmm. the legislation in front of you is a contract a proposed cooperative agreement amongst the city of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, and Gateway, where the parties would agree that there would be this trustee, both the city and county pay into the trust, and then the trustee disperses to handle these major investments that I described. So, Mr. Chairman, to, to Chief Silliman, who's the trustee? I you have to know by now. I believe it will be Huntington Bank. Uh, Jim, do you happen to know what they're uh, talking about? Yeah, yeah, to the chair, to the councilman. Yeah, I think it's Huntington Bank that will be the trustee. That's targeted. So, Mr. Chairman, to, to Chief Silliman, we're technically making our payments to Huntington Bank, then Hunting, Huntington Bank. So when... Something needs, when, when there's a capital project that needs to be done, right, they're going to redo the right field mezzanine, okay? Who then is in charge of finding those contracts, making sure, you know, et cetera, et cetera? You know what I'm talking about. Yes, you know. yes. Through the chair to Councilman Casey, um, the, uh, I, I need to answer it in two parts. Um, first of all, the, um, the ballpark improvements, the enhancements to the uh, project, Th that'll be primarily managed by the, the baseball team. Um, and and they, they, are, they are, as we speak, under contract with design firms. They are actually, you know, scoping out, uh, you know, half a dozen categories of major uh, improvements to the, to the facility. So that's part A. Part B are the eight million a year in capital repairs. That is primarily a gateway function. The way that works is that the the team will the team is kind of like the early warning system. They they will give the gateway board a heads up. Hey, it's about time to to upgrade the escalators. Um, and, the, and the way we do it at the board is we, we, we get a proposal from the team, and let's say they say to upgrade the escalators, we, we're proposing a, a $5 million <laughs> contract that would meet all the community benefit standards as far as local hiring and all that. The Gateway Board will, will look at that, evaluate it, and um, usually approve it on a first reading. Then we refer it to a consulting engineer. Osborne Engineering is on, on call uh, as Gateway's engineering consultant. Um, Osborne will evaluate the proposed repair, make sure that it's appropriate and a, appropriately, you know, it's timely to do it, and report back to the board. If the board then uh, approves it on second reading, the board sends a notice out, uh, one uh, identical notice, one to the city, one to the county. And I imagine there'll be an arrangement with this trustee because, um, you know, when, it, when you're talking about capital repairs, the ultimate funding source is going to be this trust that the city and county pay their money into. So the city and county will get notice the trustee will probably get notice at the same time, and then the trustee will make the funds available. Gateway will oversee the project and again, make sure that it, it adheres to the community benefits understanding. 
So, it, it, Mr. Chairman, to, to the chief, it really depends on what's going, what what it's going to be, whether it's the team that decides or whether it's Gateway, correct? Yep, that's so, correct. Mr. Chairman, to the to the chief, um, I know this is real complex the way this whole thing is set up with uh, the field house and Progressive Field and Gateway and who owns this and who owns that and everything, um, and I'm I'm not a fan of the analogy. Um, that you were using with upgrading our own homes because just as Councilman Bishop had indicated, um, that means that there would be a rent. And I understand there's the 8% admissions tax and that's basically how we collect our money, you know, is through the admissions tax. Um, but there's still, it's still a hard pill to swallow because as we know during COVID, correct, um, that nobody's generating much of anything. Right, we're not collecting admission tax. There's no, there's nobody in the ballpark. You know, everybody's taking a, everybody's taking a hit. Um, but you said that this is 116 million dollars over 15 years, correct? Yeah, to the council, to the councilman through the chair. Yes, that's correct. Did he say yes? Yes. Yes. And are you saying that we arrived at that? Eight million from the city, two million from Ohio, and nine million from Cuyahoga County. Is that how you came to the? 116 million? The, it's or, is, the or is the 116 the, million over 15 years just the city of Cleveland's part of it? From the chair to the council, and this is the city of Cleveland's portion only? Okay. Right. So that means there's another 30 million over 15 years coming in from the state of Ohio, and I can't do the math real quick on the county, but another 130, 130. 31, that's maybe. About 100, 131 from the county. So the chair, that's about right. right. In the ballpark. Right. It's in the ballpark? All right. In the ballpark. So uh, just to kind of piggyback on, on Councilman Polensic, you know, the capacity at um, Progressive Field is, uh, I'm sure you know, um, 35,041 seats, not including standing room only. We know that a couple of times a year that they sell the place out when the big teams come in, you know, or other good traveling teams come in. The average price of, a, of a, a ticket at Progressive Field is actually the seventh highest in Major League Baseball at $92 a ticket, right? Now, my math could be off just a little bit or not. I, I, if I'm wrong, I see the guys in the back shaking their head. It's just the information that I have. This isn't for debate. This is just kind of for, you know, our discussions for later on. You know, I, I, I hope I'm not right. But if you sell the stadium out, that's three point, a little over $3.2 million, if our math is correct on this side, uh, a game, right? And for, that means that's about 200 and a little under 260,000 at 8% that we would be getting for one of those, those games. But if the team is only putting in 4.5 million a year and has the capacity to pretty much make that up in one, if not two games per year, it's going to be a pretty hard sell, Mr. Mr. Chairman, to the chief, um, to look at an owner that is worth, I don't want to say it out loud, but, you know, we know that they're not poor, you know, when we need to do the job of selling the stadium and not the owner, as, as Councilman Griffin was saying. Um, you know, just like you know, across the street. We know that they're assets to the city of Cleveland, but when you really get down to the nitty gritty, Mr. Chairman, to the chief, you know, with the stuff that we're dealing with, with all we hear about is the, the you know, the, the largest big, the poorest largest big city, you know, and, you know, giving money to the food bank because, you know, we can't keep enough people fed. And then, you know, people who can make money hand over fist come looking for more, you know. You may not, maybe the council president, maybe Councilman Brancatelli, but I think the three of us fight for being the biggest Indians fans on council. And I've seen you down there how many times? I mean, we, we sit down there a, a lot. Um, but this one's going to be a hard sell. Um, this one's not going to be easy. And, and, and I understand the economic impact. But when you do come back to the table, please come back in two aspects. One, the team's financial benefit for this. Um, and then two will be the community's financial benefit for this. Because I really do believe that there's, there's three different aspects here. There's the stadium and, 
you know, what we get out of having the Indians in town, and we know that they're probably one of the biggest economic engines for the city of Cleveland. Um, we can't deny that. So, you know, for you to come for public funding, it really puts us in a predicament because on one hand, we're, we're, we're offering, you know, we're, we're giving out ARPA dollars to people who can't afford to feed their families. And then in the same day, we're going to pass a piece of legislation that's going to take $8 million out of the city's general fund and give it to people who are making hand over money hand over fist that, you know, the regular average normal Joe Clevelander probably isn't even going to the game. And I'm sure you guys have statistics on where the fan base comes from, you know, that's able to afford to go down there. Me, myself, I have a family of seven, you know, I'm not taking the whole family down to Progressive Field too many times a year. Hmm. You know, that's expensive, right? And that's more of an outing as opposed to, hey, let's just go for a quick Indians game, right? And that's just kind of the reality of it. And it, this is not, so when you, when, when, the, when the team comes back or if Gateway comes back, and I really, really, really do hope that we get the opportunity to have the leadership of the ball club sitting here with us. You're great, you represent Gateway, right? But there needs to be somebody at this table who represents the ball club. Uh, and, and attorneys and everything else are great, but you know, just as, as when we're hearing TIFF, I don't wanna hear from attorneys, and no disrespect to our representatives back there if you're attorneys or not. But it really needs to be somebody who's gonna be benefiting from this agreement. Um, whether that's possible or not, I, I don't know. Um, but my last point, Mr. Chairman, and I don't know if this is going to be mute or not, but um, everything in here points to uh, the Cleveland Indians. And despite what you say, they're not going to be the Indians anymore. Sure. So I know that the Guardians, I don't know if they've officially started or if they start January 1st of 2021, but I want to make sure that whoever this agreement is with, I know it says here the Cleveland Indians Baseball Club. Well, if they're not the Cleveland Indians Baseball Club, I don't want to see us get caught up in a technicality in nine or ten years saying, hey, we want a new deal because we're not the Cleveland Indians Baseball Club, we're the Guardians <laughs> or whatever. And one last thing, Mr. Chairman, to the, to, to the Chief or, or even Mr. Chairman. Um, this lease actually follows the team, correct? So if in five years or six years, the current ownership decides that they want to sell the, the team. This agreement stays with the team and not the ownership, or this agreement cannot be negotiated as part of the sale of the team. Through the chair to Councilman Casey, yes, absolutely. Okay. You, you are correct. All right. And I will simply add, everything that you spoken to in the last 10 minutes, <clears throat> I see my colleagues. <laughs> Chafing and yes uh, is good and, yeah. and Tom Yablonski of Historic Gateway has tons of stuff to I, share I, I, with I, you. Listen, but but today but, is not the day. For you're that. right. But I'm just for when we're having hearings later on down the road, and it happens to us all the time. Well, we got to get back to you. Well, we got. Well, yeah. if this wants to be, if you want this, I think you want this done by the end of the year, if I'm not mistaken. I think you you mentioned that. We're not going to have time to say, oh, we'll get back to you, yep. or we'll send you an email right. when. Everybody comes to the table, come prepared Correct. and come with all the information. Even if it's submit your questions ahead of time or what information do you want, please reach out to council <laughs> yeah, individually, you. whatever you need to do, so that when you come back to the table, we can make that informed decision and we can make the right one for the city of Cleveland. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Jones, did you have further questions? Yes, Mr. Councilman Chairman. Councilman Jones, you're at the floor, then Councilman Conway. <laughs> okay. Mr. Chairman, um, we're looking at this here, and I, I want to start out with the, the last question my colleague had asked, because it's kind of where I'm at right now in terms of information. And uh, it was a simple question. I don't know if anyone here that's sitting here that could tell us this question. I asked, do we know how much uh, the city receives in terms of rent payment from the, the Indians currently. It, it would seem to me someone should have that basic information. Well, th through the chair to Councilman Jones, as I said before, uh, my request to them was to document in their economic study not, it's an easy not, answer. not broad, indirect economic benefits from spinoff or anything like that. 
uh, but rather document the dollars that go straight from the team into the general fund, and those were the taxes that I testified. Now, there are other significant uh, benefits, and the, and the team has that in their presentation, and we'll review that with you. I have not focused on that part, so I, I, I'm not able to answer that today, but trust me, when we give our full presentation, we will be responsive to you on that point. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Gentile, what do we, what do we receive in rent payments from um, uh, the Indians team on an annual basis to the city? Jim. From, to, from the, the, to the chair, to the councilman. I mean, we don't get any rent payments. I think Mr. Silliman testified that we, directly we get around $9 million in tax. Uh, we're, we're talking rent rental payments. So you're saying the city does not get any rental payments currently from? Correct. They That's correct. Rent right. payment. I no. see. That's so correct. have we ever received a rent payment from the Indians? Uh, to the chair, to the councilman? No, not to my belief. Through the, through the chair to Councilman Jones, um, I think you would have to go back to the 1960s when the city owned the old stadium and the Indians did make rent payments to the city at that time. That stopped when Art Modell leased the stadium in 1973 because then the Indians made their payments as a subtenant to Modell uh, and Modell made the payments to the city from 1973 on. So it, the Indians have not made any rent payments to the city since at least 1973. So basically when you come back to this body, you're gonna talk about um, the other benefits that the, the Indians offer us and provide us in terms yes. of whatever that is. Yes. I see. And so, Mr. Chairman, um, to Mr. Silliman, um, do, do we have a current copy of the lease agreement now that, we, that you have within your organization that you operate off of? Can you make that available to this council? Yes. The, the next question, Mr. Chairman, um, to um, Mr. Silliman or to the administration, I presume that the mayor the director of finance and the director of law has met with you to craft this particular piece of legislation. Would that be, it, who, who put this together, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Silliman? Uh, you, uh, yeah, to, yeah, to, the, to the councilman through the chair, uh, yes, we've had some discussions with the law director, the uh, chief Dumas, myself, to um, put this piece of legislation together. And Mr. Uh, Chairman. To, to the chair to to Councilman Jones, I will add that over the course of these lease negotiations that myself and Gateway's attorney, Dennis Wilcox, had multiple, multiple discussions with Mayor Jackson and with County Executive Budish um, as, as we progressed in the discussions. And Mr. Chairman, thank you, uh, Mr. Silliman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Silliman, there is a section seven. It talks about severability. Uh, it says each section of this ordinance and each subdivision of the paragraph of any section is hereby declared to be independent. And the finding or holding of any section or subdivision or paragraph of any section to be invalid or void shall not be deemed or held to effect the validity of any of the sections, subdivisions, or paragraph of this ordinance. Uh, with that being said, Mr. Chairman, uh, to Mr. Silliman, looking at this, can you explain why this was put in here? Or to, do we have someone from our law department can explain that? Why this, this I can, severability Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's basically, um, if there's a portion of it where there, that is, is problematic for some contractual reason, it doesn't invalidate the whole lease, just that section of it. Right. And that's common lease language to make sure that one small technicality doesn't blow up the whole thing. If, if you want to add to that, but that's why you have severability. Mm -hmm. What's that? Yes, yes. I see. 
And, and Mr. Chairman, thank you for thank you. Um, answering that. That makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to uh, Mr. Silliman, the total, uh, what we have, $9 million from the county, $8 million from the city, $2 million uh, from um, the state, um, which is a total of $19 million. It comes to $285 million a year. Is that correct? Through the chair to Councilman Jones, yes. And then does that also include um, the four and a half million that um, this wouldn't include the four and a half million? No. So no. when you include the four and a half million uh, of the Indians uh, of, the, of the Dolan family uh, to this, it comes to a total of 346 million, which would be an investor? Yeah. Through, through, the, through the chair to Councilman Jones, uh, that sounds about right. And, and Mr. Chairman, um, to the director, going back to just the, the brief presentation that you gave us, I happened to look at the page on the back. I get a total of investment of $202 million. So where would the other funding go? Through the chair to Councilman Jones, uh, the $202 million is for the ballpark improvements or enhancements. The, the, the rest of the of the funding goes to the capital repairs. In other words, keeping, keeping current on what's already there, replacing the escalators and the elevators and the con uh, fixing the concrete when it, when it needs fixing and all those kind of things are under the general heading of capital repairs. And, and Mr. Chairman, do you have a breakdown of, of that that you can make available to the council? Um, how the funds will be spent. Through the chair to Councilman Jones, a breakdown of which item? There, there's a total of 285 million that's being asked from the public. There's another 61 million that would be added by the team. Um, what is the total comes to 346 million? What is those expenses be spent for? What is? What is the breakdown of those expenses? What's the allocated amount? I know you have part of that here at 202 million. Where would the other expenditures be spent? Well, the the capital repairs over 15 years uh, would be about 100 million, and then we build in a 15 million dollar reserve fund. So, but you do have the itemization breakdown somewhere. We we have a we have a gateway facility assessment which estimates for each of the next 15 years, what capital repairs you, you need to make. Can you make that available, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Yes. Silliman? And as to that, Mr. Chairman, as Please. well as the lease, who would be the best party for me to email to? to if you, just, just email it to me, please. Okay. You know, CC John okay. James. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and Mr. Chairman, to uh, Mr. Silliman, um, the revenues of the East Garage at Gateway, what are our annual revenues there currently when we're operating uh, pre before COVID? Um, through the chair to Councilman Jones, and um, uh, the, the net revenues from 2019, which was the last pre pandemic year. We're somewhere in the vicinity of 1.7 million a year. Now, currently, that entire sum of money uh, doesn't go to the general fund. It goes to repay parking uh, facility revenue bonds that are still outstanding on behalf of the Gateway East Garage and Willow Garage. Those parking revenue bonds uh, get retired uh, late in 2022. Am I stating that about right? Yeah, yeah. that's correct. It's uh, September of uh, 2022. And, and have, the, have the city already agreed to um, sell the 25 million um, East Garage to um, the Indians to help pay for part of its portion? Th through the chair to Councilman Jones, that's part of the proposed agreement that's subject to your review and approval. So there is no, uh, uh, there is no existing uh, 
commitment regarding either garage revenues or sale of the garage unless and until this council approves that term that you're looking at right now. So that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the funding sources that make up the city contributions, but it's subject to council approval. And, and Mr. Chairman, to the director, can we get that agreement, you, that full agreement that you have in place right now that, that this is referencing to? To Mr. Silverman. Full agreement? Yeah, the, the whatever, this is a partial of what you already have been under talks with the city concerning. So my question, Mr. Chairman, or well, my request, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Silliman, do we have an agreement already in place that's already written up? It's a uh, term it's, sheet. This is, has the essential terms in it. Do you, the, the, through, the, through the chair to Councilman Jones, the full agreement will be drafted by the attorneys uh, once uh, once the approvals, if, if, if they occur, happen by city council and county council. The, the attorneys have just started drafting, though they would take the form of lease amendments uh, to the existing lease between Gateway and the team. But those specific lease amendments that flush out the terms in the term sheet have not yet been drafted. I see. And, and so the, the proceeds here, the, the 1.7 million, what it, it makes is, is, is a part of the discussions right now to, to potentially sell that. And currently, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Silliman, in that garage, um, do, we, we, do we have any um, people who are leasing the garage at this current time for usage, other than the Cleveland Indians? So, through the chair to Councilman Jones, the Gateway Garage is subject to the leases of both the uh, Cleveland Guardians and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Each of those leases set a minimum number of spaces that need to be kept available to each of those teams. Um, and uh, that is one reason why Councilman Polenzik and I have a dialogue about every five years about the gateway garages and why aren't they earning more money because the gateway garages from day one were subject to a certain number of spaces allocated to the basketball team and a certain number to the, to the baseball team. Other than those arrangements, the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the city rents the garage spaces to any and all comers, but there's one other kind of asterisk there, and that is if you're parking there in the morning, <laughs> most, of, most of those folks have to be out of the garage by 5.30 to make room for the people that are attending the sporting events. Thank you. And Councilman, you're approaching time. If you have one or two more questions, we're getting on uh, your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, looking at the next piece I have, Mr. Chairman, is the gate, just want to understand the development parcel. What, what development parcel that does it speaks of? Because I don't, I don't, I can't visualize this. Through, through, through the chair to Councilman Jones, Earlier, I testified that Gateway is the property owner for the whole Gateway site. Uh, that includes the, 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 the uh, that includes the real estate that the ballpark sits on and the real estate that the field house sits on. It also includes the Gateway Plaza, which is in between those two facilities. But there's also a small acreage fronting on East 9th Street that is owned by Gateway and that has always been viewed by Gateway as an opportunity for development. Um, and um, and uh, in our discussions with the team, the team indicated a interest in purchasing that parcel and, um, and the, the tax assessment value of it is $2 million, so the the understanding that we've reached with the team, again, subject to approval, sure. is that Gateway would sell that 
for t that parcel to, to the team for two million and then plow the two million into this deal to uh, okay. you know, make up some of the funding here. Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Silliman, can you make available to us what that parcel number is or and or that address? Just a map yeah. or something. I'm so good? Yeah, almost. Okay, one more, please. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your patience. As always. No further questions. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Councilman. Councilman Kevin Gadmuff. No, 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 you. No, it's. Is Dennis still around there? Uh, th through the chair to Councilman Con Conwell, Dennis Wilcox, you're talking, is the attorney for Gateway. Dennis Lehman, or Dennis Wilcox or Lehman? Uh, oh, are you, you yeah, may be talking about Dennis Lehman, the business yeah. manager of the Indians. Yeah. You Which retired. Dennis Lehman. Dennis, Dennis retired uh, at, at the end of 20, or late 2019, I believe. So, so who can we reach out if I have, because I read this, and I'm going to call someone, meet, meet with someone. Are you the contact person, uh, chief? I would, I would. Hi, my name is Joseph Garcia. Right. And we'll exchange all. Neil Weiss, who is our, our senior VP, who manages the ballpark and, and, uh, uh, and ballpark operations as well as uh, our technology side. Uh, both of them, we will give you contact information. Okay, great. That's, that's all I need. That's all I need. Excellent. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Chairman. Council? Just one more. Council? Yeah, on the point. Just, is it possible if we could, do we know what, just, just ballpark of a question asking is the is the this this the system that we have in place in the city of cleveland that has uh, the games is the indians profitable what is the how much does the indians get on an annual basis operating in the city of cleveland how much revenue does the how much generate? revenue do they generate uh, in the city of cleveland how profitable is the team here in this market space I don't know. Do you... I, I, through, through, the, through the chair to Councilman Jones, again, uh, when we have more time, the team's going to make a full presentation on economics. And, okay. And, and they, will, they, will, they will be able to answer those questions. Uh, nice. for, for the purpose of this hearing, I didn't feel it necessary to, to learn all that information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Silliman. Thank you. Councilman Griffin, a brief point? Just a very brief point. I did just get some information. I've also been studying other cities and other cities to my colleagues, um, San Antonio, Nashville, and a couple others are already setting up commissions and committees to try to, um, to, try to poach teams from us. So as we think about that, we need to keep that in our forefront too, um, that that is something that we are racing against and competing against other cities that are mid-tier cities. So just keep that in mind too. And I would like um, to really understand those other markets and who we are competing against. But I have heard Indianapolis, San Antonio, Nashville, just to name a few. So just to keep that in mind. And I think- uh, On that point, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for one, Councilman. Yeah, I just wanted to make one comment. I think he made my point. Is as much, it's like tax abatement or anything else. I mean, as much as we don't like doing this, it's necessary. I mean, are there cities that don't subsidize Major League Baseball teams? There's plenty, and you've named them. There's cities without baseball teams, Indianapolis, San Antonio, uh, Nashville, New Orleans, that would like to have it. So, um, you know, I, I just keep that in mind. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Jones, for a final point. Yes. Um, why such a short lease, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Silliman? Why didn't we have a much more bigger lease uh, than what we have right now? It just seems so short because we'll be right back here again uh, within a possible 15-year period. Um, why such a short lease? <laughs> as, a, as a just a point. You know, uh, <laughs> through the chair to Councilman Jones, when we send you the, the gateway lease to the Indians, I don't think you'll view it to be short at all. It's a, it's a lengthy lease. Yeah. 
and it will be even lengthier if we do this agreement. Okay, I want to thank everybody. Um, this was the first of several discussions that are going to take place in the very near future. I want to encourage people to spend time on the term sheet. Uh, familiarize yourself with the terms of the deal. This is an important uh, decision that council needs to make, and it's important that we really look at the the you know the asset versus the cost versus what is the benefit of having uh, this uh, this great team in our city. So with that. Uh, finance is adjourned. I will see uh, this side of the table at 7 o'clock. Thank you.